So imagine a world where mankind was a lot smarter about its energy policies. I guess that we wouldn't be in the trouble that we are today. So this hypothetical world wouldn't have to worry about climate so much. In this world, there are also substantially less people who die from air pollution. And I think that the civilization as a whole would be far more secure and prosperous. So I will preface this video uh, by saying that I will comment on climate change issues today. Now, I know that there are a lot of people who agree with this and also disagree with this. Uh, whichever side you land on, uh, just sound off in the comments below. You can let everybody know what you think about climate change and whether you are uh, in agreement with the science of climate change or not. So, I mean, that's what it's there for. Now, I wonder whether all this talk about limiting the temperature increase by one and a half degrees is idle talk or not. And that's not because I don't believe that climate change is a problem, because actually I do. Because I believe that all this bureaucracy is putting a disproportionate break on progress, and it has done for decades now. Now, if you want to be informed about the state of our planet, I would suggest that you would subscribe uh, to James Hansen's uh, newsletter in which he shares his findings about the state of our planet. The last one that he sent out, he lays out a pretty clear case why the one and a half degrees threshold has already been breached. And I will leave a link in the de description below where you can find uh, the information if you're interested in seeing what he has to tell. So what have I told you that we had the technology and the pace to get rid of coal by 1999. And what have I told you that we could have avoided 21% of all the emissions between 1985 and 2019? You would probably be saying that I am crazy. Now, that's basically the disruptive power of nuclear energy that we have left on the table and didn't use at all. So it's wasted potential. So behind this claim of mine is the idea that we were building new nuclear power plants at an astonishing pace already back in the 70s. But the problem is that after 1975, growth actually stagnated. And we started building a lot less nuclear power plants than we were doing before. Now, we also hit some roadblocks along the way. Obviously, Three Mile Island happened. Fukushima, Chernobyl, you name it. And, and, and we have let ourselves believe that these were accidents of an unimaginable scope that we could barely handle. But we know better now. So looking back and knowing what we know today, it is entirely reasonable to consider what could have been. So the basis for all the calculations that I've done to make this video is the Nuclear Power Learning and Deployment Rates paper, which was published in 2017 by Peter Lang. What I will do is I will focus on the potential for nuclear, the emissions and the deaths that could have been avoided if we uh, did the all out nuclear build. Now, keep in mind, I'm going to use the high estimates for this video, and I'm also going to use the most optimistic growth rate for new nuclear deployments that is possible. And that's just to give you a feeling for how much potential we have left untapped and how much damage could have been avoided. So let's get into the numbers, which is what I like doing best. And I hope that you are here for, because that's the basis for this whole YouTube channel. So this is figure five of the Lang paper, and it shows us the number of construction starts per year in red. So as you can see here, there's a clear ramp up from 1960 up until 1975. Now next, and this is the most important figure, is figure six. And figure, figure six shows us that if you extrapolate from 1975 onward, and you use a curve that matches the ramp up that you can see in the graph, that you can get up to 2,366 gigawatts of installed nuclear capacity by 2015. And that's about six times more than we actually have today. So let's use the data that is available to us and see what happens if we extrapolate up to 2022 
and combine that with the real data that we can get from the internet and then we get the following graph for coal. Now, as you can see, the surplus of nuclear capacity that we could have built, that would have been sufficient to end the use of coal by 1999. Also, if we would have sustained this nuclear capacity growth rate, uh, coal would have never ever been necessary for electricity production anywhere, basically. Now, if we continue this trend, we could also start reducing electricity produced using gas in fact, when we start reducing the gas use for electricity production uh, the same way that we did with coal, and we, we start this after coal has been dealt with, obviously, because you want to first phase out coal, then you want to start phasing out gas, then we would be able to shut down gas-fired power plants in 2014. And, and one of the things that everybody talks about is the carbon budget. How much can we emit before we reach this one and a half degree threshold, which James Hansen believes that we might already have crossed. So when you consider all these policies by all these countries who are throwing trillions and trillions of dollars at, at renewables in order to, you know, basically try to build them out of this, this one and a half degree problem. Um, the carbon budget is basically uh, one of the most important bits of information that they use because it, it tells them how much they can still emit. So when we look at what the IPC says that we need to do, it's not just cutting emissions. It's also uh, making sure that we go to negative emissions, basically sucking CO2 from the air somehow. I don't know how we are going to do it. I know that it's technically possible. But the question is whether it's actually feasible because you need to process a lot of air or you need to process a lot of ocean water in order to get the CO2 out. There's also some 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 stuff that you can do like uh, 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 dumping uh, chemicals into the ocean. Sounds hard, but if you would, for instance, uh, throw crushed basalt into the ocean, it's entirely possible that the calcium and the magnesium in these uh, rocks will then react with a carbonic acid a and that's also a way how you can permanently get CO2 out of uh, the atmosphere and the ocean uh, but but enough talk about that if we look at what we are doing and consider this graph for instance you can see that we must start with negative emissions now because otherwise we will blow past one and a half degrees and i by the way i'm not even convinced that we can keep below two or two and a half degrees at this moment at the rate at that we are going so let's take let's take a step back let's get back to the data uh this this nuclear uh surplus build so when we consider the growth and we calculate the volume of electricity that originated from the burning of coal and gas during the period that we would start offsetting this coal and gas so we take the real figure and we take the hypothetical figure and we basically subtract from one another then we get staggering numbers so from 1985 until 2019 more than 238 gigatons of carbon emissions could have been avoided if we started building more nuclear power plants in 1975 and onwards now that's a staggering amount because that would basically give us more time to actually do something about all these other emissions. We could, we could do a ton of things to, to offset these emissions, but we would have more time and one and a half degrees would still be something that we could avoid, which is now unavoidable, by the way. Everyone who says we can avoid one and a half degrees is kidding themselves, really. So just imagine how much better our current position would have been if we had done that. And with that, you have reached the end of this video, which I think is awesome, especially if you're still here. Now, if you took anything away from this video, if you learned anything, please consider doing the usual stuff that everybody asks for on the internet. Now, making these videos takes me about 20 to 30 hours and I don't get paid for it. I do have Patreon members who donate a little bit of money to me every month. And for that, I mean, this helps a lot and I'm incredibly grateful for that. So currently, I mean, it's the holidays. Life has become more expensive than ever and I'm really rock bottom at this moment. So if you want to help me repairing my car, which is broken at this moment, please look in the description below how you can help me out doing this.
Now may the strong force be with you. Thank you all for watching and have a nice day. Bye-bye.